Hi, Ernesto. Uh, hi, Michael. Hi, Jose. Uh, today we have a question that says, uh, a person is going to separate from two wives and finally will not separate from his third wife. Although he's not divorcing his third wife, is already predestined. To what extent were the awareness and learning that took place in this person after the first two divorces part of the necessary material for the third divorce not to take place, even though it was already predestined? <coughs> okay. Um, that is, these are all very subtle things. The, um, the precise workings of karma cannot be adequately understood by uh, our finite intellects. Um, as as um, I believe Krishna says somewhere in the Gita, the secret of karma is known only to me. So only Bhagavan can know um, exactly what is happening. Um, we need not delve too deeply into these matters, but to the extent that we can try and answer this question, it's important to understand that the, the prarabdha, the destiny, is tailor-made to suit our present level of um, spiritual maturity. In other words, to suit the vasanas that we have. So, um, though we are free uh, to act in accordance with the under the sway of our vasanas, grace which has allotted the prarabdha, um, to put it in very crude human terms, grace already has an idea how we are going to behave, what lessons we're going to learn along the way. So um, grace knows far more than we know. Um, so uh, it's already been predetermined. It's all that is what has been the prarabdha that has been allotted to us is allotted to us for us to learn certain lessons. And Grace knows pretty well to what extent we're going to learn those lessons along the way. So this is put in in very very crude terms. It's obviously something far far more subtle than this, more subtle than I. Our intellect can grasp, but um, the <clears throat> it is as I say the the prarabdha is tailor made to suit our vasanas. So really, there's not much more than we can say about that. So yes, it it is true. In life, we learn lessons. And because of the lessons we learn, it modif the, the lessons we learn from previous experiences modifies our response to later experiences. But um, this is all also intricately interwoven. That is, the, the working of prarabdha and the working of our will are very, very intricately interwoven so we can't we can't distinguish and uh, make out to what extent um uh each is uh, influencing the other but one thing is sure what is predetermined what is predestined will is what is going to happen but it's predestined knowing more or less how we are going, but what lessons we're going to learn along the way. That is, does that make any sense at all what I say? Sí, está bastante claro. Mm. Yeah, it's very clear. It's quite clear. Mm. No tiene I mean, sentido. Sí, sorry. So, I don't know. think any of us can understand it much more clearly than this. And it's not really necessary to do so. What one another important thing to understand is that whatever is uh, allotted to us in our destiny is allotted to us for our own good. So the the the, the allotment of the fruit of our past karmas 
is entirely benevolent because it, uh, the, the fruit is allotted by God or Guru, who is our own real nature. He is what we actually are. So he has infinite love for us as we actually are. So whatever he allots for us is what will what is for our ultimate benefit. It may seem to us in short term, with that from our narrow perspective, but certain things that happen in our life are not good for us. But they're all actually good for us ultimately. So even the, the difficult marriages, the divorces, and all these things that we undergo, they're all given to us for a certain purpose, for us to learn certain lessons. Lo, lo que iba a decir es que hay ocasiones en las que por partir del hecho de que lo que va a ocurrir va a ocurrir. Uh, and, well, there are uh, uh, starting from the fact that uh, what is going to happen is going to happen. Yes. Eh, uno puede caer en la tentación de la parálisis de creer que por no hacer nada eh, eso no es una decisión también. One can fall prey to the to being paralyzed by thinking that doing nothing uh, just is that it's part of it. Y recuerdo una frase de Bhagavan en la que decía que eh, dentro de la percepción de uno mismo en tanto que yo soy este cuerpo. I remember a phrase by Bhagavan uh, in which he said that uh, within the perception of uh, oneself as uh, uh, uno mismo, percepción de uno mismo, como? Como yo soy este cuerpo. As I am this body. The Atma Budi. Mm -hmm. eh, en, en, en ese nivel rige la aparente voluntad individual donde la gracia eh, actúa a través de ella. On that level, uh, the law is that uh, the doer, doership or uh, being the doership is what is, uh, uh, is lo the law, so to speak. Uh, entonces, hermano, ¿lo puedes repetir? Sí, que la, en la, dentro, digamos, de la percepción de que hay una voluntad individual. Mm -hmm. Within the perception that there is a free will. Eh, como yo soy este cuerpo, como yo soy esta persona, o en tanto que yo soy esta persona, this person. eh, en, en ese nivel la gracia está, mm -hmm. eh, está actuando no solo por el, digamos, el pararabda karma que ha sido asignado, sino también está actuando en la medida de que podamos ir corrigiendo o rectificando nuestra percepción. The great grace is for acting or working not only through the parabda that we are going to experience, but also by uh, in us rectifying, uh, rectificando, no? The, sí. Nuestra percepción. Our perception. Rectifying eh, our perception. En, en las diferentes situaciones. In the different, different situations. De, de tal forma que no podemos saber hasta qué punto... Eh, el ir eh, soltando las diferentes eh, formas automatizadas de pensamiento egoico. In such a way that there is no way for us to tell uh, in which way uh, letting go of the automatized uh, 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 ways of behaving as ego. Eh, es necesario o es, va a ser necesario para que podamos ir liberándonos de la ilusión de ser este yo. It's going to be necessary for us uh, being free from the illusion of being this, this I, this ego. Right. Um, I'm not sure that I fully understood that, but one thing I would say, um, regarding the thing about uh, what, what you said about um, being paralyzed, um, Whatever actions are necessary in order for us to experience, in order for our prarabdha to unfold, whatever actions by our mind, speech, or body are necessary, 
those instruments will be made to do those actions. So we need not fear, but we, um, but we will be, uh, but we will ever fail to do what we need to do in order for our prarabdha to be um, to unfold, because we will be made to do that by God. Um, there are two forces driving our actions. One is the will of God. So whatever is necessary for us to do in order to experience the prarabdha, that will be made to do by him. So that's his will is one driving force. The other driving force is our own will. Um, our will is free in the sense that our will consists of vasanas. But the vasanas are just inclinations. We are not bound to act impelled by our vasanas. That is, our vasanas actually are pulling us in so many different directions. So we're constantly choosing which vasanas we allow ourselves to be swayed by and which ones we don't allow ourselves to be swayed by. This is where the real freedom lies. That is, the vasanas we have now are vasanas that we have cultivated in the past. So we can't instantly change our vasanas. We can't instantly... Um, if we like a certain thing or dislike a certain thing, we can't instantly give up that like or dislike. We can slowly wean our mind off that like or dislike by not allowing our, ourselves to be swayed by that. So every time, say, the inclination, um, supposing we dislike a person, just to take an example, every time that that um, that inclination to dislike that person rises, if we turn our attention back towards ourselves and hold on to our own being, that because we're not allowing ourselves to be swayed by that dislike, it will slowly lose its strength. It will eventually wither and die. So we can we have the power to slowly um, modify our vasanas by weaning ourselves off them. But Babasanas already, I mean, Babasanas that we have at this precise moment are Babasanas that we've cultivated in the past. So we can't undo what is done in the past. We can't, we can't, uh, those Babasanas have been cultivated. We, we, that is, we can't instantly undo it. We can gradually undo it by, uh, by uh, cultivating more and more love to hold on to our own being. And we cultivate that love by the, by, trying our best to hold on to our being. So sl slowly over time, our vasanas do change. But um, uh, the, we, the vasanas that rise at this particular moment, we, we, they are, they are uh, uh, aroused them to the surface of our mind by grace, it's then up to us. I would be swayed by them or not swayed by them. If we allow ourselves to be swayed by them, they grow stronger. If we refrain from being swayed by them, they grow weaker. The most effective way to refrain from being swayed by all the Shaya Vasanas is by holding on to our own being. That strengthens the Sat Vasana and uh, weakens all the Shaya Vasanas. That, um, but I don't know if that's an answer to your question at all. No, it, it, Sam, Sam, well, hay algo que ha emergido ahora. Something that has arisen now? En base a lo que estabas eh, diciendo, Michael. Uh, regarding to what you said. Cuando sentimos que tenemos la libertad de girarnos hacia adentro o de dejarnos arrastrar por las viseyabásanas, when we feel that we have the freedom to turn attention within or uh, let ourselves be swayed by our Vishaya Vasanas. Yeah, we do have es that solo, freedom. Claro, pero es una libertad que si tengo que dejarme llevar por una determinada inclinación para que mi cuerpo haga algo y finalmente se produzca una experiencia. But if it's uh, such a freedom, uh, if it's a freedom in the sense that 
uh, I allow myself to be swayed by that vipassana. So my body does something in order to experience some other thing. Eh, si está ordenado en el prarabdha que me deje llevar por esa vasana para llevar a cabo tal acción. If it's ordained by the prarabdha that I have to be uh, swayed by, allow myself to be swayed by that vasana in order to do such action. Mi libertad de querer eh, girarme hacia adentro. My freedom of wanting to turn within. Está condicionada por la obligación de tener que girarme hacia afuera para obedecer al prarabdha karma. Is conditioned or subdued by my uh, obligation to uh, allow myself to be swayed by that vasana in order for the prarabdha to unfold. Lo que pasa es que no sabemos en qué ocasiones sí tendremos que obedecer al prarabdha karma y, que, y en qué otras ocasiones realmente por el hecho de intentar girarnos hacia adentro. But sometimes we don't know uh, uh, to what extent in some situation, precise situation, we have to uh, be swayed by uh, anything for the parable to unfold. Y el otro, el último que has dicho, en esto? Sí, sí que, que no sabemos en qué situaciones mm -hmm. sí si vamos a, a tener esa libertad de girarnos hacia adentro y en cuáles nos vamos a ver eh, impulsados por la fuerza que todavía tiene esa visilla basana a salir hacia afuera. We cannot know to what extent we are going to be uh, uh, pushed uh, outwards for the strength of that Vishaya Vasana to, uh, to go outwards or to go within. Por eso tenemos que tratar siempre de confiar en que todo depende de nosotros a la hora de girarnos hacia adentro. So we always have to trust that it, everything depends on us uh, regarding turning within. Porque si no, estaríamos siempre pensando que quizá eh, haya una basana más fuerte que me va a impedir tener esa libertad. Otherwise, we're, we, might be, we might think that there is a stronger basana that, is, that prevents me from having that freedom. Luego, en definitiva, mi libertad de girarme hacia adentro está condicionado por mi amor o mi adicción a ser este cuerpo. So, in the este... end, my, my freedom to... Uh, turn within or allow myself to be swayed by the vasana is conditioned by the uh, love to feel myself as this body. As this ego. As or this ego. Um, firstly, the, the actions that we need, that our mind, speech or body need to do in order for the prarabdha to unfold, they will be made to do, irrespective of our vasanas or anything else. Um, exactly how grace makes us, how how God makes us do those actions, that's something too subtle for us to understand. But we will, without fail, be made to do everything that is necessary for our prarabdha to unfold. As far as the vasanas are concerned, no vasana is, uh, vasanas are just inclinations. So vasanas may impel us, but cannot compel us. That is, they may drive us, but they cannot force us. So we are always free, if we want, to turn within. Um, one thing Bhagavan said about prarabdha is that prarabdha affects only the outward term mind. So prarabdha can never prevent us turning our mind within. Likewise, we are swayed by the Vishaya Vasanas only when we allow our mind to go outwards. If we firmly turn the mind within and sink back into the heart, the Vishaya Vasanas, we, we, that if we go deep enough within, we go beyond the, 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 beyond the place where the Vishaya Vasanas can, can That is, there, there'll be no room for the Vishaya Vasanas to arise because our attention is turned within so strongly. So um, the Vishaya Vasanas can never prevent us turning within if we want to turn within. If we really want to turn within, if we really love to turn within, no Vishaya Vasana can stop us. If it seems to us that our Vishaya Vasanas are stopping us, that is because 
we why are we swayed by Vishaya Vasanas? Because we want to be swayed by them. That is the Vishaya Vasanas are our own inclinations. So because if our inclinations are strong, we will like to be swayed by them. So this is it's a very, very subtle process of overcoming the Vishaya Vasanas. Overcoming means not fighting with the mind thing. Overcoming means refraining from being swayed by them, not allowing ourselves to be swayed by them. So it's, a, it's, as I say, it's an extremely subtle process, but all we need to understand is that, of course, even when our mind is going outwards, we are, we are choosing which vasanas um, are, uh, are going to sway us. Supposing we have a, a a bad habit. Suppose, for example, we we smoke. We know that smoking is not good for our health. We want to be healthy. So we've got two opposing inclination. There's one, the inclination to have one more cigarette, and there's the other inclination to avoid having any more cigarettes because it's bad for the health. So those inclinations are pulling us in different directions. We are free to chew, to be swayed by this vasana or that vasana, it's up to us. So even when our mind is not turned within, moment to moment in our life, we are either allowing ourselves or not allowing ourselves to be swayed by particular vasanas. So we 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 are free, uh, we are making use of our freedom constantly. But the most effective way to avoid being swayed by any Vishaya Vasana whatsoever is to hold on to self-attentiveness because that all Vishaya Vasanas pull our mind outwards in one direction or another. Whereas, whereas when we turn within, we are preventing the mind going out at all in any direction if we are, if we are holding firmly enough to our own being. So the main thing we need to know is the most effective way to weaken and eventually overcome all these vasanas is the simple practice that Bhagavan has taught us, holding on to self-attentiveness. If we understand that clearly, that is sufficient because that's all we need for the, to, um, and the more clearly we understand that, the more, um, the more stronger will be our motivation to hold on to our own being. Because we know if we don't hold on to our own being, in other words, if we don't surrender ourselves to Bhagavan, we surrender ourselves to him by holding on to him, and he is our own being. If we don't surrender to him, we will be surrendering ourselves to the Vishaya Vasanas. And we know from experience that the Vishaya Vasanas only causes trouble. Es so, como si estuviéramos eh, en un lugar que está expuesto a granizo, lluvia. It's a, a, as if we were somewhere which is exposed uh, to hail, rain. Y todo lo que trataras de hacer dentro de ese paraguas o bajo ese paraguas. Uh, it's, it seems as if uh, everything you we try to do under that uh, umbrella, under that shelter. Eh, va a estar eh, muy condicionado. Uh, it's going to be very conditioned. Y luego tienes una pequeña puerta que te permite salir de, de, de ese ámbito, de ese paraguas, salir fuera. And, and there is like a, uh, it seems as if there is a small door that allows you to, to come out of this, that situation, that umbrella. Que es en donde al agarrarte fuertemente a ti mismo al establecerte fuertemente en el sí mismo uh, which is where you establish you firmly uh, hold on to, to yourself or we hold on to ourselves dejas de estar expuesto a todo lo que cae dentro de la, del, del bajo el paraguas you stop being exposed to all these those things all those uh, hail or rain that are falling como el ejemplo de la sombra del árbol que compartía eh, As in the example that uh, Sadwam shared about the, uh, the person who is under the shade of the tree. Y que salimos al sol y, y, y nos olvidamos de que hay una sombra que nos puede cobijar y proteger más que ninguna otra cosa. We come out of the shade uh, not knowing or being unaware that there is uh, this shade that can uh, 
uh, where we find the best shelter that we that we can find. El problema que que veo habitualmente con muchos de de los amigos hermanos de yo soy tú mismo. The problem that I see often with many uh, friends from yo soy tú mismo. Es que ha habido una se ha desarrollado una fuerte negación a la adicción de ser un eh, cuerpo. Eh, ¿Cómo cómo ¿Se ha, se ha desarrollado? Se ha desarrollado una fuerte negación de la adicción a creer ser un cuerpo. A strong negation has been developed developed to the addiction of uh, being a body. Y porque el llegar a estas enseñanzas para muchas personas con muchos temas sin resolver previamente. Because getting to these teachings for many people who have uh, unsolved issues. Hace que, que, que desarrollen un mecanismo de defensa muy fuerte para negar que todavía se sienten fuertemente enamorados de su falsa identidad de ego. It's like a, uh, it's very easy for them to develop a self-defense mechanism uh, to hide that they feel uh, themselves attracted to that uh, uh, identity of being the ego or the body. Um, that is, we, we each have to decide for ourselves what it is we, we want, whether we want to continue in this, um, we, that is, we need to use our discrimination. If we want to continue in this ego state, we are perfectly free to do so, but we, there's, a, there's a heavy price to be paid for rising as ego, as we all know from our own experience. So the, we all need discrimination. That is the, the, the wisdom to recognize, but turning outwards, going outwards is foolish. To cultivate this wisdom, the most effective means is this practice. So we all come to this path with our own past baggage. But the, the solution, whatever type of baggage we may have, the solution is the same, holding on to self-attentiveness. The big question is, are we, are we willing yet to embrace this solution? If this is, if we are willing to embrace this solution, this is a solution to all problems, because it's the solution to the root of all problems, namely ego. If we are unwilling to um, to uh, resort to to cling to this solution, we have to continue suffering until we until finally we we receive enough blows to realize how foolish it is going outwards. Once someone asked Bhagavan, Bhagavan, we read your teachings, but there's no happiness in the external world. The happiness lies only within. And um, when we read it, we are convinced by it. We, we are sure what Bhagavan says is correct. But still our mind is going outwards. Why is that? Bhagavan simply said, because you haven't had enough of it yet. So, the, the, what is the benefit of going out? The more we go out, the more we receive blows, and sooner or later we will learn the lesson that going outwards is foolish. We are all at present, when we, once we take to this path, we are, we are dangling between two extremes, the extreme of going outwards and the extreme of going inwards. The extreme of going inwards is the solution but we are not ready to wholeheartedly embrace that solution because we're not fully ready to let go of the world. But at the same time, we, we've understood at least to some extent that the world is a problem, but, but allowing the mind to go outwards is a recipe for misery. So we are, we are torn between the, the Bishaya Vasanas, the, the strong inclinations to go outwards and the developing um, satvasana, which is gradually growing in our heart um, and inclining us to go more and more and more within. So, um, it was, we each, no, nobody else can follow this path for us. And we cannot, we, that is, we can, 
We can discuss these things with others. We can point out what Bhagavan says, but it's up to each one of us to apply his teachings in our own life. To the extent to which we do so is entirely up to us. It's, it's, nobody else can, can, can help us to do to turn within and cling to ourselves. We ourselves have to have to have to have the love to do that. If we don't have that love, nobody else can help us to turn within. So even if we feel we don't have sufficient love, at least we've got the very fact that we are interested in Bhagavan's teachings, the very fact that we're talking about Bhagavan's teachings means we already have some inclination in this direction. So let us build on that inclination. However, however slight an inclination it may be, we have to build on it by trying our best to turn within as much as we can. The more we turn within, the more the inclination will to turn will within will grow strong and the inclination to go outwards will grow weak. So yes, we all come here with, <laughs> that is, why do we come to Bhagavan's path? Because we're imperfect. If we were perfect, there'd be no need for Bhagavan or his, or his teaching. We have need of Bhagavan, we have need of his teachings because we are full of so many uh, Vishaya Vasanas, so many that are pulling us outwards. So we, um, we, we just have, to, each one of us has to decide for ourselves, are we ready to, to, to put in the hard work that is required to cultivate this sat vasana and to root out the weed out the vishaya vasanas. We cu cultivating the sat vasana and weeding out the vishaya vasanas is all the same process. Both are achieved only by turning within and surrendering, thereby surrendering ourselves more and more and more to Bhagavan. Lo que sí veo muchas veces es que hay como una especie de autoexigencia muy fuerte en los que empiezan a practicar este camino. What I see often is that those who start in, on this path, they are very self-demanding. Eh, en el sentido de que quieren pretender poder estar conscientes eh, en caibalia de sí mismos en medio de las interacciones y relaciones con otros. In the sense that they want to be uh, uh, like in Kaivalya, firmly establishing themselves uh, in, in the, amidst the interactions with other people or all the time. Sin entender que o sin aceptar que no pueden llegar a un grado de giro y de permanencia en su pura autoconsciencia de una forma radical, sino es yendo poco a poco. Without uh, accepting or not understanding, they, they cannot uh, be fully uh, established in uh, self-attentiveness uh, the whole time. Es como decir, vas conduciendo un coche y eh, tu nivel de atención para atender al volante y a la carretera al principio es grande. It's like driving a car, for example, in uh, where your level of attention to to, to attend to the steering wheel or the road is quite big. Y en la medida que vas pudiendo permanecer en la atención interior cada vez con mayor profundidad. And as you can be uh, uh, attending to uh, yourself uh, more, pro more progressively, increasingly. Más va llegando la convicción poco a poco de que lo que tus manos hayan de hacer para manejar el coche se hará. Uh, the conviction grows that uh, what your hands uh, will have to do to drive the car will, will be done. Pero es, es muy habitual ver cómo muchos quieren ir a las prácticas típicas de estar aislados, en silencio, sin conversar con otros, sin trabajar, sin andar, por creer que. Eh, el tratar de ese aislamiento, de generar ese aislamiento. But uh, very often uh, uh, they might think that uh, uh, go to practices like where they isolate themselves from other people or not talking to anyone or something. 
va a acelerar el proceso sin, sin darse cuenta de que todavía no tienen ese amor por permanecer en sí mismos sin presenciar otra cosa. It's going to speed up somehow uh, when uh, they still don't have, when they're realizing this, they still don't have the sufficient love uh, to be uh, attentive to oneself the whole time. Yes, love is the absolute key. That is concerning skills, other skills. You mentioned the example of driving a car. Let's take something a little bit more difficult. Um, let's say flying an aeroplane. That, that requires a certain skill. I may very, very much want to fly an aeroplane, but I won't be able to fly it. I may somehow, by luck, be able to get it off the ground, but I certainly won't be able to land it again safely without a certain amount of training. So for most worldly undertakings, merely having love for it, I could have love to be the greatest singer in the world. But if I don't have the natural talent, and if I don't have sufficient training, I won't be able to, I won't, however much I may want to be the greatest singer in the world, I cannot be. Um, so all external undertakings depend on, to some extent, they depend on a liking, but to a great extent, they also depend on, uh, on Uh, training and mastering certain skills. But in the case of turning within, only one thing is required, that is the love. If we have the love, where there's a love, there's a way. That is, we will automatically find our way inwards if we, have the, if we truly have the love to go within. The problem is a lot of us say, oh, I want liberation, I want... Uh, Um, we 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 think we have a very superficial understanding of what liberation is, and we we say we want it. We we may even genuinely believe we want it, but we are not yet ready for it. We don't. We are not truly willing to pay the price. We are not truly willing to surrender ourselves, rather than thinking about. Uh, attaining jnana or attaining mukti or attaining anything, it is best to consider this path to be a path of surrender. We are not here to gain anything. We are here to surrender everything. So are we willing, if we ask ourselves honestly, are we willing to give up everything? Are we willing to cease rising as ego, cease knowing anything other than ourselves, cease experiencing anything other than ourselves, cease doing anything? If we're on, if we are, if we are realistic with ourselves, we will recognize we we don't yet have sufficient love. That is the reason why ego is still flourishing. Why we still haven't surrendered ourselves is because of our lack of love. So. Um, This path is the path of love. It's also the path of knowledge. So we need to use our discrimination. We need to distinguish between the superficial um, liking on the surface of our mind to the real, deep, um, wholehearted, heartfelt, all-consuming love to surrender ourselves entirely. Just because we like the idea, oh, mukti sounds very nice. They're having yanas, that sounds very nice. We, that, that's just a more superficial level of the mind. But are we really ready to pay the price for that? Because we can attain that only by giving up everything else. We can't have jnana or mukti or any of these things plus anything else. It's this or that. We can't have... because. The, the price to be paid for mukti is annihilation of ego. And when ego is annihilated, everything else is wiped out along with it because everything depends upon ego. So until we are willing to give up everything, to surrender ourselves entirely to Bhagavan, to ask nothing of him, but to give ourselves wholly to him without any expectation, we are still not ready for that. So we we need to If we, if we understand the teachings correctly, and if we are realistic with ourselves, we will understand there is only one problem. 
That one problem is our lack of love, our lack of willingness to surrender ourselves. That is that is all that is required. So how to cultivate, how to gain this, this willingness to surrender ourselves whole, wholly, it is only by this by patient and persistent practice of trying to turn our attention within. Whenever the attention comes outwards to, to feed on other things, we need to be willing to try to turn it back within. We will fail. We will fail time and time and time again. But so long as we continue trying, we are moving in the right direction. Jose, uh... You want to say something? Uh, yes, I had a couple of questions too, um, right. Michael. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of things regarding the vasanas. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, considering vasanas, does it is a the totality of my vasanas right? So, if yeah. I could sum them up and and um, Quantify that force with which yes. the tank goes out. The that quantity of vasanas, um, whatever hell I were to experience, cannot exceed the whatever number of vasanas I have today. So, whatever hell I were to experience, my vasanas are required for that. I have to not be willing to not grasp yes. in order for me to suffer. Yes, yes, exactly. This is a huge information, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is. If, it is if, uh, we, if we suffer, it is entirely of our own making. If, if, right. Supposing we are put in hell. Hell need not be suffering. Why hell is suffering because we don't like that, uh, whatever condition hell may be, we don't like that condition. If we are willing to give up that, that dislike, if we are willing to rise above our likes and dislikes, heaven will not be uh, heavenly and hell will not be hell-like. It, it, all, our, all our pleasures and pains are caused entirely by our likes and dislikes. And likes and dislikes are the first sprouting of the um, Vishaya Vasanas. The Vishaya so, Vasanas uh, are the inclination that give rise to those likes and dislikes. So, so every time I tip away a Vasana, I'm tipping away hell itself or any possible yeah, hell. Yeah, exactly, experience. exactly. But the more we go deep in this path, the more we are weakening the Vasanas, that is weakening the Vishaya Vasanas and strengthening the Sat Vasana. The Sat Vasana is the strength that enables us to remain unaffected by whatever um, whatever may be thrown at us. So even if we if we've got a strong Sat Vasana, that is to the extent that the Sat Vasana is strong, the Vishaya Vasanas will be weak. So the stronger our Sat Vasana, the less we will be affected by either heaven or hell. Hell, but it, no big deal. Okay, let me roast for a while. Hell, no big deal. Let I mean, we we, we will we will be we will gain that udasina baba. Udasina baba means that attitude of indifference. That is veragya. We'll be indifferent to what is happening. Try, try to practice udasina baba. Yes, right. yes. But how to practice that? We can't directly practice that. The, the way to do it is to hold on to ourselves more and more. Then the udasina will grow automatically. Of course, we can also do that when our mind's going outwards by trying not to be perturbed by whatever's happening. That's that's a rather indirect way of cultivating the udasina baba. That also helps, but the most effective way to cultivate that Udasina Baba is by turning within more and more and more, holding on to our own being more and more. Sí, porque puede haber una confusión aquí y es creer que practicar la Udasina. There can eh, be a confusion here because they, they believe that practicing that Udasina 
es más efectivo que atenderse a uno mismo y ver cómo la audacina que resulta de esa autoatención es de otra calidad. Is uh, thinking that practicing that audacina is better than turning within and cultivating a true audacina, <laughs> not uh, if, that results out of that. <laughs> if we think we are cultivating audacina but not turning within, then it's not audacina. That is the Udasina means the disinclination to go outwards. And we can have that Udasina only to the extent to which we have the love to go within. Well, the problem is that turning within means I don't grasp. You and don't... Uh, if I turn within, I, I won't grasp anything. And yes, you can exactly. <clears throat> That's a problem for me, the ego, because I, yeah, I have yeah. to grasp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, that's why Bhagavan gives us something very simple. The nature of ego is grasping. But the nature of ego is to always grasp form. Bhagavan asks, asks ego to grasp itself. He doesn't say stop grasping. He just says right. grasp yourself. Well, it, <laughs> it forces us to grasp ourselves by pointing out that this entire world is false. Yes. Because in my grasping, I don't settle for just grasping. But when I grasp, I have to take it that what, I, what I'm grasping has to be real. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't want to grasp an imaginary friend or here, an imaginary yeah. what. It's yeah. got to be real. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But by <laughs> being pointed out that it's false, that I have to, blah, yeah. I grasp now. Understanding the falsity of it is one great aid. The other great aid is understanding the misery of it. Exactly. That is, the world is, is a that embodied existence, rising as ego, is a state of misery. Correct. Because well, we are seeking little iotas of pleasure here and there, we overlook the fact that the very desire for that pleasure is itself a misery. That is the very nature of ego is to be always discontented. And that we ego cannot overcome its discontentment, its dissatisfaction by trying to grasp anything else because other things are all finite. What ego is, what, what we all want is infinite happiness because infinite happiness alone is our real nature so nothing other than our own real nature can satisfy us so so long as we are still seeking pleasure outside or seeking pleasure outside also means trying to avoid misery outside that is our, a lot of our external endeavors are not only to experience pleasure, but also to avoid misery. But the very fact we are going outwards is itself a recipe for misery. Okay. So the only solution ultimately is to turn within and merge back into the heart. So, so, so Michael, does it follow that in this, by the same line of thought, because all the summation of my vastness and the totality of all my, of my will represents the force in which I can experience any possible hell, the deactivation, the chipping away of all those vasanas is also chipping away any hell, but at the same time, the subsidence of all vasanas, it's at the same time my greatest happiness. Yes, yes. If but the vasanas will sub the vasanas will subside only to the extent to which ego subsides. So if if um if I dea so if vasanas are present, problems are there. Whatever worst possible situation I can be in is dictated by my vasanas. If I chip away all of that, whatever best possible position that I can be in is just a total absence of all vasanas. Yeah, yeah. But so the absence of all vasanas is the absence of ego. The absence of means the I have, yeah. I'll be destroyed along with the yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Need the ego um, yeah. identification. Okay, so so I ha we have the keys for both hell and heaven. Exactly, it's all within us. It's all within us. It's all our own making. We it's up to us. Ultimately, we are all responsible for our own misery. 
whatever misery we may be experiencing, it seems to us, oh, the external circumstances are causing my misery because I've got this problem, I don't have enough money to pay the bills, because of this problem or that problem. So life is full of so many different types of problems. We think those problems are the cause of our misery, but they are not the real cause. The real cause is our liking to go outwards. I see. Ese ir hacia afuera es... Me recuerda una, una frase de Brahmach Namak cuando decía que el deseo era como un caramelo envenenado, que sabe muy dulce por fuera. That one thing to go outside liking is reminds me of uh, a phrase by uh, who? By a phrase? Brahmagnama. Brahmagnama that says that uh, a candy is like uh, very sweet, so it looks very appealing, very good, but it's like a, it's like a poison. Sí. Yes. Y, y, y to, toda esta miseria que es ego eh, se trata de alguna manera de ocultar bajo esa promesa del deseo que va a satisfacernos al girarnos hacia afuera. And all this promise, all this misery that this ego is like hidden, so to speak, under that false promise that is going to satisfy us in any way by going outwards. Yeah. Hmm? All pleasures are sugar-coated poison. On the, on the surface, they look very pleasurable, very sweet, but they actually are just, um, they, they are, they are causing us bondage, misery, and so on. Now, uh, Ernesto pointed out that uh, something that I think is also important, it has to do with it, we going out. Um, and this is something that I got from Begaman's teachings, I think it's a valuable, the jewel, one of the jewels that we get out of it is the tight relationship between grasping and basada. So there is a tight relationship between yeah. me grasping, me attaching, me and my basada, yeah. and also a tight relationship between my attention and my basada. Yeah. So the entire system, attention, grasping, desiring, or avoiding, yeah. that is a very tight yeah. system. Yeah, that is the, the basanas of the inclinations to grasp. And how do we grasp things? The ego is a formless phantom. So how does it grasp things? It, we grasp things in our awareness. That is, ego has no, it, because it's a formless phantom, it's got no hands or legs to grasp anything. We grasp in our awareness. So that means the... the the tool by which we grasp things is our attention. Holds on to it by means yeah. of attention. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and if we are keenly, if we have a, a focused attention, attention becomes unidirectional. That's what I feel also. So yeah, yeah. Um, if we go unidirectionally towards ourselves, by means of doing so, we're not attending anything outside, meaning the vastness be, begin, be, begin to wither, they begin yes. to yes. lose yes. strength through a very painful process of almost asphyxiation. Yeah. Because they're, they're, it's like respirating. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's painful because of our reluctance to let go. It wants to go mm. out. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the pain is caused by our, by the, the conflict with, within our own will, between right. our liking to go within and our liking to go outwards. Well, the liking to go within is the liking to disappear, I guess, from- Yes, as yes, it. exactly. Because uh, we now, we are, when we talk about Vasanas and ego and Vishaya, we are talking about it as a system made of parts, but in truth is an atomic system. It's just it's me. Yeah, One yeah, yeah. Thing there, I yes. have to grasp, and now I'm turning within, and yeah. then I yes. join myself. As Bhagavan says in verse twenty-six of Ulujunapadu, "Ahandeya yabamam." Ego itself is everything. Right. So yeah. it is an atomic system that has to subside, basically. Yeah, yeah. And because I want to go to heaven. All this put together simply means going within, 
it's yeah. upsetting and that it's what's required okay I just going to say heaven is just a slightly less painful hell. But that is the heaven of the Shayas. Yes, yes. That is a heavenly world. Yes. It's a heavenly heavenly misery. Yeah. But when all lessons go, uh, that, that yes, is that, not a heavenly misery. That, that is just heavenly heaven. The, the, the heavenly, the heaven of egolessness. That is a true heaven. Yeah, that alone is a true heaven. The only one. That's why Michael in uh, Bhagavan says so uh, like strictly in, in Nanyar in paragraph 14 that when the world appears it experiences dukkha. Yes, exactly. Like, exactly. Many of us many of us would say that no how come at least there is some some slight happy some happiness there is. Yes, yes. <laughs> you wouldn't agree to But that is as Bhagavan says earlier in the same paragraph it seems so because of our lack of viveka. Mm -hmm. If we have Viveka, we will recognize that going outwards is misery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we fail to recognize, to recognize yeah. that, that true. Why do we fail to recognize? Because our mind is so clouded by the Vishaya Vasanas. Mm. So as we go within more and more, the Vishaya Vasanas lose their strength, they dissipate. So we experience more and more clarity, and they become clearer and clearer to us. But going outwards is misery; going inwards alone is happiness. Hmm. Right. But as that happens, all these likings begin to, um, instead of agreeing with this amazing idea, they they just put up a fight. They and put up a fight. Yeah. <laughs> eventually, the one who has it ourselves puts yeah. up a fight. Yeah. And yeah. It's like drowning. It's like yeah. Esto me recordaba cuando eh, una vez, eh, no sé si fue que le preguntaron a, a Bhagavan acerca de cuándo realmente podíamos dar por sentado desde el punto de vista de la percepción. Once, uh, reminds me once that Bhagavan was asked uh, when we can take for granted uh, or uh, that from the point of view of perception, eh, el final de toda necesidad de esfuerzo, the end of all effort that is required. Eh, cuando de decía cuando desaparezcan las triadas, los triputis y las diadas. When diets and triads disappear. Y la antes estábamos hablando de eso de las diadas. And earlier we're, we were talking about diet. Eh, como lo, lo, lo más eh, básico y fundamental de la distinción y la diferenciación entre bueno y malo, bello, feo. The most basic distinction between what is uh, good or bad or uh, pretty, uh, pretty and ugly and things like that. Yeah. Y, y esto me lleva a ver que hay como dos niveles de de restricción o dos formas de restringir una más útil y otra menos útil uh, uh, hay dos dos como dos formas de dos formas o dos vías de poder restringir nuestra emergencia como ego uh, the, it makes me this makes me think that there are two ways that in which we can uh, refrain from uh, rising as ego o contener también o dos formas de contener uh, see, to refrain, no? Refrain is the verb or? Refrain, yeah. Refrain. Sí. Eh, una de ellas que es muy, muy habitual y sugerida, por ejemplo, eh, por los eh, más eh, refinados cabalistas. One which is suggested by people who study the Kabbalah or uh, those who know about deeply the Kabbalah. Es eh, tratar de mm, contener El, el impulso de la bestia por querer emerger. One is to try to, to contain the, the impulse uh, of the, the beast. Y, y la, y la fórmula que nos ofrece esta enseñanza. And the formula that this, te this uh, teaching has for us. Es que no basta solo con restringir. El, el impulso por dejarnos arrastrar por la Vishaya Vasana. It's not enough to refrain from the impulse of the Vishaya Vasana. 
sino que si no te eh, asientas firmemente en tanto que la conciencia yo soy, seguirás estando eh, dentro de la gravedad de Aham Priti, del yo pensamiento. You will be still uh, in the uh, Ahamvriti, uh, in the what is uh, the situation of the Ahamvriti and the domain of Ahamvriti. The, the domain, yes. Um, that is, if we just try to curb the Bishaya Vasana, the inclination to go outwards, firstly, it's very difficult to do so, but it is possible. Um, yoga is that that is what yoga is all about. That is why pranayama and all these various yoga practices are there, are just means by which we can resist the pull of Vishaya Vasanas. But without the self attentiveness, if we resist the pull of Vishaya Vasanas, the mind will subside in layer. Uh, Self-attentiveness is the key to bringing about manonasa. Subsiding in layer is no solution at all. It's just a temporary respite. So but, but that's why Bhagavan put all his emphasis on being self-attentive. That's why Bhagavan said about yoga, in yoga they say, Yoga's chitta britti nirodaha. That means yoga is to curb or restrain or, or to subdue the, the chitta britti, the activity of the mind. Bhagavan said that is impractical. Why is it impractical? Because it will only, every day when we fall asleep, we restrain the chitta brittis and we subside in sleep. But that doesn't solve our problem. So the problem is not merely the, the chitta brittis, all the other thoughts, all the other mental activities, but the real problem is the first thought, the root thought, the aham vritti, the, the, the thought called I. Only by cutting that can we, can we free ourselves from all chitta brittis. And how to cut that aham vritti? That aham vritti is the false awareness, I am this body. Why is it a false awareness? Because this body is not what we actually are. So it's an awareness of ourself as something other than what we actually are. So it's a false awareness. How to remove this false awareness of ourself? The only way is by correct awareness of ourself. That is why self-investigation is the only means to bring about mananasa, the permanent dissolution of mind. Otherwise, if we simply... Uh, Avoid being swayed by the Vishaya Vasanas without clinging to Satvas, without clinging to ourselves, to our own being, we will end up in Manolaya. Sorry, I raised that, my hand. That is why Bhagavan says, for example, in verse 16 of Upadesh Undia, he says, he begins with the clause, Vele Videngale Vittu. That means, uh, um, giving up uh, external vishayas, external phenomena, that is an adverbial clause. That, so it's only a, a subsidiary clause. The main part of the sentence is manam tan oli uru ordele, the mind knowing its own form of light. Their knowing is not a participle, it's a verbal noun. So that is the subject. The mind knowing its own form of light is the subject of the sentence. And all the lay, a, the a is a, is a, is a, emphasizes that. So that means alone. The mind knowing its own form of light, that alone is unmayunachi, the, the real awareness or awareness of reality. So in order to turn the mind within, to know its own form of light, its own form of light is a metaphorical way of saying its nature is pure awareness. That is the light of pure awareness is what Bhagavan is referring to there. Which and why does he say its own form of light? Because that's our real nature. That that light of pure awareness that's ever shining in our heart, as I am. That is our real nature. That is what we actually are. So, 
in order to turn the mind within, we need to let go of other things. But if we just let go of other things without turning the mind within, we will subside in layer. So, so Bhagavan's emphasis is, is not on trying to avoid the external things. His emphasis is on going within. That's why in the sixth paragraph of Nana, he says, Etane enningal erinomenna. However many thoughts arise, so what? Bhagavan doesn't ask us to be concerned about the thoughts. All he asks us to be concerned about is turning within. If we turn within, automatically the thoughts will subside. But if we're struggling to, to, to make all thoughts subside, subside, to suppress thoughts by controlling our breath or by any other means, we may be able to achieve that. But the result is just a temporary state of dissolution. It's not cutting at the root, because in mano layer, ego dissolves, but it's going to rise again. Yes. But it, it, it is different. The the restraint uh, is different. El, el simplemente restringir, como pasa en el yoga, ¿no? De it's tratar different. de darte la respiración. Is it different? Uh, simply restraining, as in yoga. Eh, a el, el, lo más efectivo que sería atenderte completamente a ti mismo sin atender al pensamiento the most effective uh, thing which is attending to yourself to oneself without attending to your thoughts pero habría un, un punto intermedio ahí but there is a, a, a somewhere in between no tan efectivo como la pura autoatención si eh, presenciar ningún pensamiento porque ya sabemos que es el ego el que lo hace not as effective as uh, attending to oneself because uh, we know that it's ego who is, who is doing that pero es mejor entiendo que en lugar de restringir la mente como en el yoga but I think it, I understand that it's better than restraining the mind as in yoga al menos tratar de Mirar con la intención de trascender y soltar at least to try eh, lo to falso. Look, to try to look uh, at it with the intention uh, to try to let go of what is false. Sorry, I didn't quite understand. What is better than yoga? I, I didn't quite catch what that is. Okay. Better than yoga is to attend yourself as you really are. Yes, but yes. Uh, the other extreme is uh, try to restrict the mind, to rest, uh, refrain the mind uh, as in the yoga. Uh, yes. Okay, but I say that there is an intermediate uh, position, no? Yes. That is, is not better than to attend yourself, no? As yes. you really are. But to try to look what is false in your view as ego yeah. and, and let go. As uh, this uh, partial let goes yes. that uh, um, is um, driving you to the absolutely self surrender. Right? Yes, but the the in practice the problem with that is the very nature of the mind is grasping. The very nature of ego is to grasp. Ego cannot remain for a moment without grasping. So. If we are not grasping ourselves, we'll be right. grasping something else. So, um, of course, yoga is a way of letting go of the grasping, but there's no intermediate. As soon as you let go of the grasping, without grasping yourself, you subside in layer. But it, it may be what you're saying, I'm not sure exactly. When our mind is going outwards, during our day-to-day -day activities, we should be cultivating an attitude of indifference. We should, be, we should be using our discrimination. When the mind is rushing outwards to grasp this or that, we should use our discrimination to dampen the enthusiasm which we run outwards. That can be a, a supplementary aid to turning within. So cultivating that, that attitude of surrender, that attitude of indifference to things, that 
that can help, but it's only helping. I mean, it only helps to the extent to which we utilize that help to turn within. Turning within is absolutely the, is absolutely the key. If we are if we are practicing trying to turn within, automatically we will become indifferent to other things. Automatically, we'll be less concerned about the problems of life because we'll be seeing more clearly that problems from beginning to end, our life is full of problems. But the problems that we're facing now, after a year, we will have forgotten about these problems. The problems we were facing a year ago, we've forgotten now. So problems is the very nature of, of life. <laughs> there will always be problems of one sort or another. But the clearer, the more we go within, the clearer our mind will be, and the clearer, more, the clearer it is, the, the more we will clearly recognize these. It's just not worth expending our attention on worrying about these problems because problems sooner or later resolve themselves in one way or other. Mm -hmm. For the problems, anyway, it all comes according to prarabdha. So the same prarabdha that has given us the problem will also give us the solutions to the problem. So we, using our discrimination to 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 um, reduce the um, momentum with which we're rushing outwards, is beneficial. But we can use our discrimination that we gain that discrimination. To, and the necessary vairagya to do so only to the extent to which we go within. So the key to success in this path is turning within more and more and more. And uh, Michael, for example, the this, uh, as you say, you know, in daily life, daily situations, like uh, sometimes you get lost in thought and you think you have like one problem or another. And you wonder, like, uh, okay, how is this situation is going to turn out in the end? No, you find yourself, and you yeah. suddenly, all of a sudden, you remember, okay, this is all predestined. This, whatever is going to happen, is going to happen. Yes, that's just a help, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then you have to uh, have to turn within. Yes, yes. Another yes. way, for example, as Jose pointed out before, is the see at least. Uh, understanding that the the world is uh, false uh, yes, yes it's all with because i think ma many things that are are derived from the belief that the world is is is, is uh, exist all by itself yes, yes, because yes for example i don't know if the, if the world exists independent of our perception of it then there, there has to be some true happiness in there yeah, or yeah, yeah. there is the uh, the truth can be out there not here yeah. in this yeah. uh, or the, the world can do harm to me because it's real uh, i mean there are yeah. many things that can be uh derived from the or can sprout from the belief yeah. of, yes but of course that's not the main yeah. it's just uh so, a help so, an aid yeah so understanding bhagavan's teachings thinking deeply about his teachings trying to apply his teachings to the situations in which we find ourselves, all these are great aids on this path. But the key is turning within. Because even to understand Bhagavan's teachings deeply and clearly and correctly, it is possible only to the extent to which we go within. Mm -hmm. And learning how to apply Bhagavan's teachings is part, we will get the clarity to know how to apply his teaching only to the extent to which we go within. So the absolute, I mean, what Bhagavan's, the, the central point, the core of Bhagavan's teachings is turning within. That's what all his teachings are pointing us back in one direction towards our self alone. So everything that he taught us about prarabdha, about the unreality of the world, about the misery of, of going outwards, all of these are pointing us in the same direction. Go back within, go back within. Know yourself. Yeah, exactly. You, you said before also that we, uh, 
it's, it's us who want to be swayed by our Vishaya Vasanas, yes? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Because the, the Vasanas are our own likings. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, we feel it's us. <laughs> so yeah, we yes. happily we learn yes, all yes. ourselves. But also in the case of uh, bad feelings, so to speak, or bad, like, feeling fear, or things like that, we might not think maybe because of our uh, Aviveka that, uh, okay, I allow myself to be swayed by my happiness, maybe, uh, of uh, things that are uh, outside. But uh, when I experience fear or, I don't know, guilt or some other thing, is uh, it's due to our Aviveka also that yeah it, yes because, yes all, so all it's due to Aviveka has been cultivated in the past now it has a, a strength yeah yes as impetum uh, so it has a lot of momentum yes and as you said before we cannot cut it all of uh, uh from in one split second obviously yeah, yes yeah so it's going to uh, have some momentum yeah like yeah it's going to be reduced over time yeah yeah. And we cannot expect it to to disappear all at once. Yeah. But the thing is, that eventually it will all disappear at once. But mm -hmm. we have to work hard to get to that point. Right. Right. <laughs> right. The thing is, we like the the problem is not only that we like or dislike things, but that we like them and dislike them with full force. Yes. 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 The, the emotion that is. The emotional thought, um, the emotion, what we, our emotional investment in our likes and dislikes and so on is, is, the, is the, where the real strength of them lies. Yeah. So we can, we can um, divest of that emotional investment only by patient and persistent practice of turning within. Right. Hey, algo que estabas diciendo antes, Michael. Something you said earlier, Michael. Mm. I don't know. Sometimes I speak in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Is the pronounced? Eh? Sorry, I'm. I'm. Estoy perdonado. <laughs> um, uh, I try to speak in English. Okay. <laughs> uh, before you said, Michael, that. The point uh, is that the inertia of ego is always trying to grasp. No? Yes. And if, if you try to understand how are you moving or uh, driving for your vasanas to this emotional activity of this like or dislike, no? Mm. Uh, with instead the, the 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 intention that you really have mm. instead of the good intention of you to try to not be swayed by by this uh, visayavasana you are in the in a place or in an in, in a in a in a form of ego and your nature is grasp yes and it's, it's better to go out of this influence of this nature of always be trying to be grasping uh, than uh, try to understand and uh, um, and give up any uh, thoughts uh, that comes from ego, no? Mm. Yeah. It's, it's very, it's very important that, yeah. that. That is, we can never give, without giving up ego, we cannot give up grasping because grasping is the very nature of ego. So the only way to overcome ego is instead of grasping other things, which is the which is the normal, the natural uh, uh, way, the, the natural direction of ego is to be going outwards to grasp. We must we must train ourselves to to try to grasp our own being. So, uh, trying to give up grasping without grasping ourselves 
is a futile effort. We need to, we need to accept the fact grasping is the nature of ego. So let us, rather than grasping anything else, which is bondage, let us grasp ourselves, which is liberation. But we need to, to, to accept too that in some in some cases in in, in some uh, occasions, no, mm. you don't want to attend yourself. You prefer no, yes. to grasp. Yes. And yes. when you prefer to grasp, it's better that you try to understand the illusion that you are going to yes. To, no, that's, we, uh, we, whenever that inclination to go outwards is, 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 is raising its ugly head in a particularly strong fashion, this is where dwelling on Bhagavan's teachings, thinking about Bhagavan's teachings, thinking that all that Bhagavan taught us about the unreality of the world, about the misery of the world, and just the Bhagavan's teachings in general are a great aid because they um they uh will rekindle in our heart that love to go back within and the so, implication of the of the teachings mm. in your experience in this moment that you only want to grasp and you don't want to turn within yes to to understand for example no what, what we are talking before no yes that you don't want to be indifferent to some like yeah, and you want to believe that this gives you happiness, and it's impossible. And yeah. and so and try to understand very profoundly in this moment, no? Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. This is this is where sravana and manana are the greatest aid to the nidityasana. Sravana means reading Bhagavan's teachings. We, we're not all the time reading Bhagavan's teachings or listening to them, but even when we're in the midst of other things, we can be dwelling upon them, thinking about them, and thinking how Bhagavan's, what Bhagavan has taught us applies to this present situation in which we find ourselves. That is the manana. And that very quickly uh, restores us to nidityasana, to trying to turn back within. Now, Michael, you mentioned uh, that we have to grasp ourselves. And I mean, I can grasp a lot of things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but grasping myself, can I actually grasp myself? I mean, I don't think I can try. You can try, but ultimately, ego can I never grasp. E yeah. That is what we actually are, is pure awareness. Can ego ever grasp pure awareness? No, it cannot. Yeah. But though it can never grasp pure awareness, it needs to try to grasp pure awareness yeah. because only by trying to grasp the pure awareness, which is its own real nature, will it lose itself in that. And be that. That, that is, when we succeed in grasping that uh, pure awareness, we then remain as pure awareness because what knows pure awareness? Only pure awareness. Nothing other than pure awareness can know pure awareness. That so, cannot all the grasping in this. Yeah. Uh, so so by by ego trying to grasp itself, it loses itself in itself. So this is such a this is this is the divine secret the Bhagavan has revealed to the world, this nature of ego. But that is what Bhagavan says in verse 25 of Uludunapadu, that summarizes. The, the, the very core of his message. But the nature of ego is to rise, stand, and flourish by grasping things other than itself, grasping forms. Mm -hmm. But to subside and dissolve back into its source, to take flight by trying to grasp itself. This is, as far as I'm aware, this has not been made clear in any of the thousands of scriptures that exist in this world. But this is the absolute key to, this is the key to liberation. That takes flight. It's very deep. It's very deep, very, very deep. Seems very superficial because it's such yeah, yeah, a Yeah, 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 yeah. But, 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 but that's part of Bhagavan's genius. He, mm. he says such profound things in such simple words. 
Grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Grasping form, grasping and feeding on form, it flourishes abundantly. Leaving form, it grasps form. If sought, it takes flight. How simple are those words, but how very, very deep is, is oh, yeah. that is science in physics they have laws of nature they they find certain laws but what is the ultimate law of nature it is what bhagavan reveals in verse 25 of uludunapadu because when ego comes into existence everything else comes into existence so the key to the creation sustenance and destruction of the world it's all given there in um in verse 25 of Uludunapadu, if we understand it correctly. Right. Mm. Right. right. Yeah, because uh, after all, science is the things the other way around. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's looking outwards. The big bang, <laughs> big bang uh, the right. universe, the, the uh, yeah. Uh, but, but, matter, matter gave rise to some evolved uh, forms of uh, life, uh, yes. but, no, oh. uh, gradually evolving, and then gave rise to people and animals and plants, and yeah. people evolved into consciousness or right. rose consciousness out of nowhere. Yeah. We are just looking back at the <laughs> at the beginning of. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. That's what science says. But who created science? You did. It, yeah, it's all in my mind. Science oh, is my. entirely in my mind. That science that you're judging, yeah, it's your dream. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's all part of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> yeah. And well, go going back to the to the original question, Michael. Yes. Regarding the uh, se separation or yeah. Yeah, uh, because there is the the whole thing is very com complex. Yeah, because um, let's say that uh, well, you you had two wives. Yeah, and mm. the third wife you had you didn't you weren't supposed to. Yeah, to yeah. separate from that wife. So uh, or or the opposite. Let's say you have to also to have a third divorce, for example. Yeah, yeah we we just see the third divorce happening. Mm. And and we might say, okay, it's obvious, no? You know, this your behavior is bad to her. Yeah, you, know, you are rude. You are very. You don't do anything. You just yeah. Uh, the, so that lead seems to lead to the divorce, but yeah. the divorce was just a fruit of things that you did in the past. Yes, that is assigned to you, right? Yes, yes. So may, we, we don't know what actions you did. Yeah. in order for the divorce to happen yeah yeah but uh that the complexity there because we uh we cannot account for the all the things that you did as the real reason for the divorce no no right even though they seem they seem to be the the reason for the divorce no yeah, yes uh, superficially you know people yeah. say obviously you know how he behaves he gets yeah uh, yeah uh, that is action actions and the fruit of actions and the vastness that give rise to the fruit of action, I mean, to be actions that give rise to the fruit, mm -hmm. all these are extremely complex. But why are they complex? Because all these are external. Karma is something outside ourselves. That is, in order to do karma, or to experience the fruit of karma, or mm -hmm. to be swayed by the vasanas that make us do the karma in the first place, mm -hmm. we have to first rise as ego and look outwards. Mm -hmm. When we look outwards, there's infinite complexity. Look at the world. Look at the, I mean, take any 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 form of human studies, whether it is any of the various branches of science, whether it is um, whether it is history or sociology or psychology or anything, any type of external knowledge is extremely complex. But it, it, all that complexity is unreal. The, the underlying truth is extremely simple. The underlying truth is one only without a second. And what is that one? We are that. So if we 
if we allow our mind to go outwards, if we are, yeah, I mean, the reason Bhagavan taught us this law of karma is to make us understand that we need not be concerned about this prarabdha. We need not be concerned about these things. All we need to be concerned about is turning within. But if we try to dwell on this law of karma, try to understand all these things, we are just, we'll get bogged down in unnecessary complexity. Bhagavan's teaching is not pointing at the prarabdha, but what he teaches about prarabdha is intended to point us back at ourselves. You need not worry about prarabdha. You need not worry about karma. Who is the one who does the karma? Who is the one who experiences the fruit of the karma? That is what we should be concerned about. That is very, very simple. Because the, the doer of the karma and the experiencer of the fruit of the karma is one fellow, I, this ego. So if we investigate that ego, we cut up the very root of this vast, complex tree of uh, karma, this tree of samsara, this great ocean of action, as Bhagavan calls it. it. It's all extremely complex if we look outside. But if we look back to who am I, the doer of karma, who am I, the experiencer of the fruit of, act, of karma, we return to this absolute simplicity of our own real nature. Now, I also have a question there, sorry. Yeah. Yes. If he looks at that marriage certificate, whoever yeah. is divorced, I'm not sure. Yeah. The person who's divorced, he looks at the marriage certificate. Check it, if you read it carefully, it'll have a name. Yes. Person's name. Yes. Peter, John, whoever. Yeah. We, this mind, um, takes some this person as I. Yeah. Now I will just to illustrate. I'm care, this is a basketball. Yeah. The, this basketball does not have the option to say it's a soccer ball. Yeah. But somehow the mind plays that trick. Yes. It pulls the trick to say it not being a person. Yes. Takes a person as I. It's yes. only thing I know can actually pull that trick, but it's still a trick. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the the divorce and the marriage is for the we experience it for ourselves because we because take we take ourselves to be that body. person who's involved in that. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Likewise, the whole prarabdha, prarabdha is not for us. It is for the one who takes that is prarabdha is for the person. Right. But, but one who experiences the prarabdha is the eye that says, I am this person. Right. If we, so we don't have to experience prarabdha. The choice is ours. We can turn within and thereby not experience the prarabdha. We have to experience the prarabdha only when we allow our mind to come outwards. That's why Bhagavan all, all often said, prarabdha affects only the outward term mind. It can never prevent us from turning within. So if we want to be free of prarabdha, if we want to be free of the fruit of our past actions, we need to turn within. And by turning within, not only will we free ourselves from the fruit of the actions, we'll free ourselves from the actions we're doing now. We'll separate ourselves from both the doer and the experiencer. We are the doer and experiencer only when we rise as ego and look outwards. If we turn within, ego will thereby subside and the doership and experiencership will cease. This is what Bhagavan says in verse 38 of Uludunapadu. If we are the doer of actions, we will have to experience the resulting fruit. When, we, when one knows oneself by investigating who is the doer, doership will depart and all the three karmas will slip off. Um, there is something that, for example, when we say the what we're we're going to live in this life as prarabdha is the result of the fruits of the fruits of the of the um, agamias, no? Of yes. The last uh, lives. Yes. These these fruits are 
mental causes. Uh, I say, for example, no. Mm, if I try to to lie to persons in mm. some lives, mm. this tendency, this visayavasana, no, uh, can be at the same time a tendency, a vasana, and at the same time a fruit, no. I, I need to live experience where something, someone are going to lie me, for example. No, mm. to I understand yeah. what what is what uh, what I don't uh, I don't see about uh, about the lie or, or all the the misery of of lying no? in the life. No. Yeah. If this cause uh, my belief in attack, my belief in lie, my belief in in uh, whatever, no, is transcends because I detect the disillusion and the, that all is going to give me more more uh, suffering in my life. Mm -hmm. In taking this to the example of the third wife, no, mm. if I give up absolutely this uh, intention absolutely eh? mm. this intention to lie this belief in the lies or, 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 or whatever mm. maybe the the reason that finally I continue with my third wife yes. is accord with this uh, inner transformation yes 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 Yes, this is the, the, uh, the intention of the yes, of the yes of the cause, no? Yes, but one thing in the earlier part of your question, you that is, we we need to very clearly distinguish the seeds from the fruit. Though they come together, they are distinct. The seeds of the vasanas, the inclination to do the action, the fruit is what we have to experience as a consequence. Of yes. the, of the, so they're two distinct things. When we do an action, that action has a fruit. The fruit is then in my, well, as soon as we do an action, the fruit is in the hands of Bhagavan. It's no longer in our hands. What remains is the seed. So that that is the, um, the more you do an action, the stronger that seed becomes, so you do it again and again and again and again. It's it's that that is the the effect of the seed can be felt immediately. The effect of the fruit will cannot be experienced in this life because what we're experiencing in this life is the fruit of actions from previous lives. But the the seeds, if you start to um to wean yourself off certain vasanas now, you get an immediate benefit from that. So in the case of this, uh, of uh, the marriage, if you learn from your past mistakes, but if I lie, it leads to discord and, uh, and that eventually leads to the breakdown of marriage. So you can, whenever the urge to whenever the inclination to lie rises no let me not lie let me be honest let me tell the truth let me be that change in your behavior is possible to affect in this lifetime itself but you cannot change what is destined if, if but, that but, but that it's possible is to, mm. destined to end in divorce it will end in divorce whether you yes. like it well however much you may reform yourself it will still end in di yes. divorce if it is not to end in divorce even if you neglect to yes absolutely yourself, but it, if you don't know if your divorce uh, is will happen <laughs> yes maybe what is necessary to 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 happen for you don't divorce yes is this transformation between? Yeah, yes, yes. But the transformation, if you transform yourself, if you give up lying, for example, you are, that, that giving up lying is itself its own reward. Whether it, but it's not going to change whether you get divorced or not, because that's already been uh, predetermined. Mm -hmm. However, we can't say they're completely disconnected because the, the, the prarabdha may have been 
um, may have been um, allotted in such a way, may have been allotted by grace, by Bhagavan, knowing that you have the maturity to learn certain lessons in this life. So that's why I say, the, the, this is why Krishna says in Gita, the secret of karmas cannot be understood by anyone but me. This is why it's, we really need, that is, we need to have a basic understanding of basic principles of the law of karma. That's all. We shouldn't try to, to, to puzzle over it too much because it, it's, we're thinking about things other than ourselves. Actions are not ourselves. The fruit of actions are not ourself. The basanas are not ourself. So it's all. Um, it's useful to have an understanding of this because that will help us to turn our mind within. But we shouldn't be dwelling upon these things. Um, that once we've understood it, okay, that's sufficient. We don't have to dwell more upon it. If we dwell more upon it, we haven't understood the intention with which Bhagavan is teaching this. That is always with Bhagavan's teaching. We need to understand not only what he says, we also need to understand the implication of what he says, and we need to understand the intention of what he said. Why does Bhagavan say this? What, what is the use of teaching this law of karma? How does it benefit us? Anyway, prarabdha is going to happen anyway. So what, does it, what difference does it make whether we know about prarabdha or not? The difference it makes is if we understand that everything is going to happen as it is destined to happen, we will be less concerned about, oh, or um, this time I must avoid, uh, I must behave myself so I must avoid getting divorced. We, we can be dwell dwelling too much on these external things. The only purpose of our present life is to turn within. That's the only substantive change we can make in our life is by turning within. So we shouldn't be concerned. We should understand the basic principles of the law of karma. We should not try to, to investigate the details because the details are unimportant. The basic principles are there to teach us, but we shouldn't be concerned. We need not be concerned about the external life. What we need to be concerned about is turning back within. So um, when we first get the parabda, teaching how karma, the entire yeah. system works, it seems pretty, um, I would say, magical, and to be honest. I mean, it's a, yeah. it's a, all an idea that it's, it's very um, metaphysical and esoteric, and we yeah. don't understand how it works. But I feel like as we move forward, we understand the purpose and the truth in it. Yeah. It's it's just as uh, it's just so that we surrender. Yeah, yeah. That is most of Bhagavan's teachings. We can we can understand the truth of them from our own experience. For example, but we are not this body or mind. We can understand that by reasoning based on our own experience. One thing that we do need this law of karma. There's no. We, we have to just take it on faith. There's, there's no other way. But we need not be concerned about it because the law of karma is not really our concern. The only yeah. purpose of the law of karma is to, is to help us not to go out. I mean, the only purpose of understanding this law of karma is it will help us not to go outwards. So that requires faith. But most of Bhagavan's teachings doesn't require faith. It just requires us to understand the reasons why Bhagavan says so. But but even, even this, what we are taught about prarabdha and about karma, the whole law of karma, the, um, the, uh, the, if we understand that the purpose of that is to turn ourselves within, we won't worry about the fact that, oh, we need faith to, to accept this. Right, yeah. right. It's good to have... I mean, we all live in this world on faith. We trust certain, so many things. When we go to a supermarket and buy food, 
we trust that that food is going to nourish us and not poison us. So we, we, we don't test every bit of food to, to make sure it's not poison. We take so many things on trust. We trust our parents when we're small. We trust our teachers. We trust the, the news. We trust so many things. Um, and we can't live in this world without trust. So it's reasonable to trust this law of karma because of the benefit we get from it. If we understand it correctly, it will it will help us to turn us, us with our mind within. That's all that is all we need be concerned about. The sole aim of Bhagavan's teachings is turning our mind is to to. to uh, prompt us to turn our mind within, because that is the only solution to all problems. Yeah, I think it also helps to um, chip away on one very important and problematic feature of ego, which is doership. Um, because, yes, um, doership is inevitable. I mean, doership is the very nature of ego, because when we rise as ego, we always take a body and mind as ourself. So the actions of that body and mind are actions done by me. I am thinking, I am speaking, I am, I am talking, I am, uh, I am uh, sitting here. So right. all these, the, the doership is inseparable from ego. But if ego, if me as ego were to totally take on board the Prarabd idea that Bhagavan yeah. is giving me, if I were to go full all out with Prarabd, even this conversation itself, every word I'm saying, it's something that this body mind system is saying, I have nothing to do with it. Um, if I turn my attention within, it, it wrecks the entire, my entire ego nature because then I'm not doing anything. Yeah, yeah. If at every moment, every second I just, this is for Abda. That's for Abda. Yeah. Oh, that's for Abda. At every moment of my life, from mm. here till I die, well, I will not be there to die because yeah. I need, in my grasping, I also grasp and perform action. Yes. It, but, I cannot have a wife and not say that I didn't. It's like, oh, this beautiful wife, it just landed from heaven. Bhagavan gave her to me. No, I'm never. <laughs> yeah. I went up and did this many amazing things. Yeah. And now look this thing, person I have, whatever. I mean, it could be anything, car, house. Yeah. But if I say that, it's, this is all my destiny. What yeah. do I have to do with this? Yeah. Yeah. Swimming. But it, it's it's useful and necessary to think this is all destiny only when we allow our mind to go outwards. Why should we allow our mind to go outwards in the first place? That should be our attitude. Right, right, right. Yeah, because we took our mind outwards. Now we have to be given yeah, this. Yeah, bill. yeah. <laughs> so for the outward turn mind, understanding the law of karma is helpful to turn it back within. Yeah, to humble us down. Yeah, yeah. That is perhaps that. Yeah. But the whole essence of Bhagavan's teaching, if we grasp this one thing, the sole purpose of everything that Bhagavan taught us is to turn our mind back within. If we understand that, that is the that is the very key to Bhagavan's teachings. Everything yeah. else becomes clear to the extent to which we understand, but it is pointing our attention back within. Right, right, right. Yeah, of course. It, it creates a reasonable doubt as to who am I the doer. Yeah, yeah. A, and B also detaches from everything else. Exactly. Om namo bhagavate sri aranachala ramanaya.